Hello, everyone. Um, Robert, thank you so much for that um, wonderfully generous introduction. Um, thank you, Claudia, and everybody at the Hammer for, for hosting this amazing evening. I can't believe how many people are here. Um, I wish we could all be in the same room together, but it's really neat, all these pockets all around the museum of people gathering and hopefully having discussions after um, with one another and keeping this conversation going. I also want to thank, of course, my friends and colleagues at the Nation Institute and Magazine um, for helping to, to make this, this night happen. Um, thanks. Um, I am going to actually start by reading uh, a section of the introduction to the book, uh, and, um, and then do more of a talk. So this is from the intro. What gets me most are not the scary scientific studies about melting glaciers, the ones I used to avoid. It's the books I read to my two-year-old, looking for a moose is one of his favorites. It's about a bunch of kids that really, really want to see a moose. Have you ever seen a moose, they ask. They search high and low through a forest, a swamp, in brambly bushes, and up a mountain for a long-legged, bulgy-nosed, branchy, antlered moose. The joke is that there are moose hiding on each page, but you can't really tell at first. But in the end, the animals all come out of hiding, and the ecstatic kids proclaim, we've never, ever, ever, ever seen so many moose. Now, my son really likes this book. And on about the 75th reading, it suddenly hit me. He might never see a moose. I tried to hold it together. I went back to my computer and began to write about my time in northern Alberta, tar sands country, where members of the Beaver Lake Cree First Nation told me about how the moose had changed. One woman described killing a moose on a hunting trip, only to find that the flesh had turned green. I heard about all kinds of strange tumors, too, which locals assumed had to do with animals drinking water contaminated with, to with tar sands toxins. Mostly, I just heard about how the moose were gone. And not just in Alberta. Rapid climate change turns north woods into moose graveyard, reads a May 2012 headline in Scientific American. A year and a half later, the New York Times was reporting that one of Minnesota's two moose populations had declined from 4,000 in the 1990s to just 100 today. Will he ever see a moose? Then, the other day, I was slain by a miniature board book called Snuggle Wuggle. How embarrassing. It involves different animals cuddling, with each posture given a ridiculously silly name. How does a bat hug, it asks. Topsy-turvy, topsy-turvy. For some reason, my son reliably cracks up at this page. I explain that topsy-turvy means upside down, because that's the way a bat sleeps. But all I can think about is the report of some 100,000 dead and dying bats raining down from the sky in the midst of record-breaking heat across Australia, whole colonies devastated. Will he ever see a bat? I knew I was in trouble when the other day I found myself bargaining with starfish. Red and purple ones are ubiquitous on the rocky coast of British Columbia where my parents live and where my son was born and where I've spent about half my adult life. They're always the biggest kid pleasers because you can gently pick one up and give it a really good look. This is the best day of my life, my seven-year-old niece Miriam, visiting from Chicago, proclaimed after a long afternoon spent in the tide pools. But in the fall of 2013, stories began to appear about a strange wasting disease that was causing starfish along the Pacific coast to die by the tens of thousands. Termed the sea star wasting syndrome, multiple species were disintegrating alive, their vibrant bodies melting into distorted globs with legs falling off and bodies caving in. Scientists were mystified. As I read these stories, I caught myself praying for the invertebrates to hang on for just one more year, long enough for my son, then one, to be amazed by then. Then I doubted myself. Maybe it's better if he never sees a starfish at all. Certainly not like this. When fear like that used to creep through my armor of climate change denial, I would do my utmost to stuff it away. 
change the channel, click past it. Now I try to feel it. It seems to me that I owe it to my son, just as we owe it to ourselves and to one another. But what should we do with this fear that comes from living on a planet that is dying, made less alive every day? First, accept that it won't go away, that it is a fully rational response to an unbearable reality. Next, use it. Fear is a survival response. Fear makes us run. It makes us leap. It makes us act superhuman. But we need somewhere to run to. Without that, the fear is only paralyzing. So the real trick, the only hope really, is to allow the terror of an unlivable future to be balanced and soothed by the prospect of building something much better than many of us had previously dared hope. Yes, there will be things we will lose, luxuries some of us will have to give up, whole industries that will disappear. And it's too late to stop climate change from coming. It's already here, and increasingly brutal disasters are headed our way, no matter what we do. But it's not too late to avert the worst, and there is still time to change ourselves so that we are far less brutal to one another when those disasters strike. And that, it seems to me, is worth a great deal. Because the thing about a crisis this big, this all-encompassing, is that it changes everything. It changes what we can do, what we can hope for, what we can demand from ourselves and from our leaders. It means there's a whole lot of stuff we have been told is inevitable that simply cannot stand. And it means that a whole lot of stuff we have been told is impossible has to start happening right away. Can we pull it off? All I know is that nothing is inevitable. Nothing except that climate change changes everything. And for a very brief t time, the nature of that change is still up to us. So that's the end of the reading portion of the evening. So this, this book went through a whole bunch of different titles. Um, sometimes titles are easy, and sometimes they're, they're really tricky. And um, you know, with my first book, No Logo, I had the title before I'd written a word. Um, that was, those were the days. Um, with, with, with this book, we, I went through a lot of, t a lot of different uh, title possibilities. And I, I ended up with this one because I think one of the things you want from a title is um, for it to start the conversation where the conversation should start, especially because the first question from journalists is often, why is this your book title? And the reason I think that the idea that climate change changes everything is a good place to start is because we need to accept that we have waited so long and we have allowed greenhouse gases to accumulate in the atmosphere for so long, and because they stick around for a couple hundred years, um, there are now no non-radical options left on the table. By which I mean that if we stay on the road we're on, uh, our climate scientists and also some of our most conservative institutions, like the World Bank, the International Energy Agency, Price Waterhouse Cooper, they are telling us that if we continue with what they call business as usual, uh, we are headed towards uh, in increasing uh, temperatures from pre-industrial levels by between 4 and 6 degrees Celsius, which is around 10.8 Fahrenheit, a 10.8 degree increase. Now, our governments, um, when they gathered in Copenhagen in 2009, agreed to not let um, temperatures warm past two degrees Celsius, beyond which was considered too dangerous. Now, there was a big debate at the time. I was in Copenhagen, um, particularly coming from island states, from, from, uh, from African countries, saying that two degrees was, was, was much too much. Um, uh, but, but yet that is what even the US government agreed to. It would not move beyond two degrees. And so now we're being told that we are headed towards four to six degrees. And all we have to do to get there is nothing. Just keep doing exactly what we're doing. Um, because 
of course, what we're doing, though it's called business as usual, is not actually business as usual because the easy to access fossil fuels uh, um, are running out. So uh, the fossil fuel industry is doubling down on even dirtier forms of fossil fuels. And that means um, oil from the tar sands, from tar sand deposits in Canada, but now increasingly in the United States. It means gas from fracking. Um, it means lignite coal, which is a particularly dirty kind of brown coal with higher emissions and so on, higher risks, deep water drilling, Arctic drilling. We're upping the ante. We're taking greater risk. We're emitting more. Our emissions are going up by about 3.5% a year. Um, our emissions have gone up by 61% since our government started negotiating about lowering emissions. Um, so what this means is radical changes to our physical world. Um, this business as usual does not keep us in the world we're in. It radically changes our world. But scientists tell us that they, you know, they, they, they can't really predict. I have a section of the book on what would a four-degree world look like, and I got a lot of help from leading climate scientists, including James Hansen, Michael Mann, who will be speaking here, all helped out with that section. But the truth is their models break down. We know we're talking about massive crop failures. We know we're talking about major metropolises disappearing under the waves, everything changing. Now, there is, there's also um, a, a growing um, field of would-be geoengineers um, who, who say that it might be possible to avert some of these outcomes if we radically intervene um, in the climate in, in the climate system deliberately by fertilizing our oceans, by spraying sulfur into the stratosphere to try to reflect some of the rays, sun's rays back to space. Um, now, these are also involve changing everything. They involve uh, tampering um, with, uh, with, with, with the, the, the fundamental workings of complex systems in ways that we cannot predict because it's impossible to build a model of the Earth's atmosphere so you actually can't do any kind of reliable experimentation before you would deploy it. Um, so you would be using the world's population as your guinea pigs when you deploy. But Many of the computer models show that if you were to uh, use, um, for instance, the most popular of these methods that, that gets discussed is, is uh, sometimes called the Pinatubo option because you would be um, deliberately uh, imitating a volcano, the effects of a volcano, what the models show is that it would um, likely interfere with uh, the monsoons for Asia and Africa. Um, so you would be tampering with the water and food sources for billions of people on the planet. That's pretty radical. So it is not too late to avert these catastrophic outcomes, um, but the catch is that this also involves changing everything not about our physical world, but about our political world and our economy, because we've run out the clock on reformist options. Um, now, the first chapter of the book uh, is called The Right is Right. Um, and what I mean by that is not right about the science, but right about some of the political implications of climate change. I spent uh, an unfortunate amount of time hanging around with um, the, the, with the, some of our leading climate change deniers. I went to um, one of these Heartland conferences that they have every year, which is just like the Woodstock of climate change deniers. And, um, and what's interesting about this world is um, it's entirely a product of the right-wing think tank uh, infrastructure in in Washington DC um, you know all the sponsors are the Heritage Foundation the Cato Institute the American Enterprise Institute is all the usual suspects and the Heartland Institute most people only know the name it's not very well known in association with climate change den denial but in fact the Heartland Institute is just a free market think tank like all of the others and when I interviewed Joe Bast who's the head of the Heartland Institute I asked him how he got interested in, in climate change, and he said that he realized that if it were true, that it would be a, a license for the left to do whatever it wanted. <laughs> um, and he said, so we took another look at the science. Um, 
So in other words, it wasn't that they found a problem with the science. It was that they understood the political implications of the science um, and then set out to shoot holes in the science. Um, and, 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 and many of the people I interviewed at the Heartland Institute admitted that this was their trajectory, that they understood the political implications. Now, it is true that if you are a free market fundamentalist, right, um, if you believe that, um, that, that greed is good, that it is the best way to achieve the best possible outcomes for the, for the most people, that, that government is the problem, not the solution, that it has to get out of the way and unleash the profit motive um, however, however it can, um, if you believe that there's no reason to have a public sphere, that you should privatize everything, that there, and that you should lock it all in with free trade deals. I mean, this is the ideological project of our age. They've won. You're, we're all living living in their world, right? Um, if you believe that, then you must deny climate change. Because if it is true, you, your whole ideological scaffolding falls apart. Because obviously greed is not good um, if the unleashing of greed and, the, and, and this whole economic project is causing our planet's life support systems to destabilize. And, the, and you know, just more Concretely, if we think about the, the, the pillars of this project that we have all been living through, really, since Reagan and Thatcher, and many of you were born afterwards, but take it all for granted, but the pillars are um, privatization, deregulation, cuts to corporate and, and uh, corporate and individual taxes paid for through cuts to social spending and all locked in through free trade. So you know what I do in the book is look at how a serious response to climate change makes each one of these the, these projects essentially impossible. You know, if you actually were going to respond to climate change in line with what scientists are telling us we need to do, the, the level of emission cuts. Um, so, I mean, the most obvious one is public spending, right? I mean, if you want to change the bones of your economy, we have an economy built on fossil fuels. It's not some small thing to get off fossil fuels. And now, also, we've waited so long that the storms are coming anyway. So there's two major kinds of public investment that we need to make if we are going to admit that this is real and that we have to deal with it. One, we need to shore up our public infrastructure because weak public infrastructure makes us so much more vulnerable to heavy weather. I mean, how many more examples of this do we need, right? Um, but, you know, Katrina was the ultimate example of that collision between heavy weather and a weak and neglected public infrastructure, not just the actual physical levees, um, but, you know, we all remember that bizarre moment when it seemed as if FEMA could not find New Orleans for five days, right? Where it was just, there was no government, there was no one home, right? Because the government had been so hollowed out by this war, on the public sphere, by the successful war on the public sphere. And I always remember that Jonah Goldberg, that was a right-wing columnist, um, wrote a column, a panicked column, saying, you know, we, you know, during a crisis, we really do want big government to ride to the rescue, right? Um, but that's not what happens anymore, because we have gutted uh, our, our states in the way that we have. Um, so we need that, we need to be spending to protect ourselves from the storms, and we also need to be spending to get off fossil fuels. So that means huge investments um, in, in, in mass transit, and it needs to be affordable or better yet free. We need light rail, we need these sorts of big public works projects that have fallen out of fashion. Um, and we need to fundamentally change our energy system. So that's huge infrastructure investment, although it doesn't need to be huge infrastructure necessarily, but it definitely needs to be a very ambitious project. Um, so how do you reconcile this with the living in an age when we're told all the time that government doesn't have money, and, how, and, and it's so clear how this collides, right? Um, in Greece right now, in the grips of austerity, um, this is a, it's a very climate vulnerable country. Uh, it's very hot. It's a little like California. Um, and their, their fire trucks don't have spare tires going in to fight forest fires. Um, 
Australia is facing a similar collision between the logic of austerity um, and, and the imperatives of responding to the climate crisis. We saw this in England this past year where there were historic floods and you've got David Cameron who's sort of the poster child for, uh, for the austerity agenda in, in England. Um, you know, he suddenly loses his religion because his base is going, wait a minute, um, we're flooded, where's the government once again, right? And it turns out that Cameron has laid off a thousand people from the agency that is charged with flood defense in England, knowing full well that this is one of the predicted uh, um, effects of climate change in the UK. And they have cut at, at around 300 flood defense programs, and a thousand more jobs are on the chopping block. And Cameron is so panicked in the face of this angry base that he says, we will spend whatever it takes. Um, words that, that people never thought that they, they would hear from, uh, from Britain's right-wing prime minister. Um, but you see that collision. There's no way to reconcile the two. Now, obviously, this creates a problem because we are told all the time that we're broke. So that means that we have to go to where the money is. Um, and this flies in the face of uh, another one of those ideological pillars, which tells us that we can't tax the rich. <laughs> um, and, uh, and that moved away from the regulatory principle that governed environmental law up until the early 80s, which was polluter pays, right? And um, you know, that was the way in which we approached environmental crises up to the 1980 passing of the Superfund Act. Um, but this fell out of favor under Reagan. This was, became known as command and control environmentalism. Um, and it all became about corporate partnerships and win-win and cajoling corporations to do this voluntarily. Right? But I think that clearly this is, if our governments are indeed broke, um, and we certainly made ourselves a lot broker by, by bailing out um, the bankers after the 2008 financial crash, um, now we can't actually bail out the oil companies um, and the other polluters from this crisis that they created, um, which means that they're going to have to help out with it somehow. And uh, I think some of you, or many of you, probably heard the sort of quite remarkable news um, last week as part of all the climate climate um, week around the UN summit that the Rockefeller family announced that they were going to divest their, um, their, their, their parts of their family fortune from fossil fuels. And one of their major foundations, the Rockefeller Brothers Foundations, joined the fossil fuel divest invest movement. More and more, the divestment movement is um, calling not just for divestment from fossil fuels, but for the money that is currently invested in fossil fuels by public interest institutions like universities, museums, foundations, religious institutions to be shifted to investing in the next economy. And I saw this really interesting interview um, with Valerie Rockefeller where she, t where she was asked, well, isn't this kind of ironic? Your, your family fortune comes from fossil fuels. And she said, no, it's not ironic. It's, it, I, we have a particular moral responsibility bec precisely because our family fortune comes from fossil fuels and fossil fuels have created the climate crisis to fund this transition, which is exactly right. But the, um, the descendant of Standard Oil, of the Rockefeller, uh, of the company founded by John D. Rockefeller is ExxonMobil, the most profitable company in the world that made $45 billion in profit in a single year. So however we, you know, if we, if we accept the reality of this crisis and the huge price tag associated with preparing for the storms and also getting off fossil fuels, we clearly have to um, resuscitate the polluter pays principles, and we can't afford to allow those billions to hemorrhage into the pockets of shareholders anymore. They have to be harnessed to fix this crisis, as happened with tobacco companies. And this is what I think where the significance of the divestment movement um, comes into play, that it's not that it's going to bankrupt Shell and Exxon, um, but it is part of a delegitimization process of saying those profits that are being earned on a business model that is knowingly destabilizing um, our, 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 our life support systems. And we know this, right? I mean, many of you are familiar with Bill McKibben's Do the Math, and, 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 and this is all based on the carbon tracker research out of the UK that shows us very clearly that the, that the fossil fuel companies have um, in their proven reserves five times more carbon than can be 
that can, then can be burned and still leave us a 50-50 chance of staying below two degrees Celsius warming. Um, so that is their business model. And they have a business model that requires that they always have as much in reserve as they have in production. This is not a legitimate business model <laughs> um, based on the science that, that, that we now have. So we need to get a hand. A handle on those profits, our hands on those profits, and I think there's a, there's there are all kinds of other um, ways that we can uh, tax the activities that are helping to fuel the crisis. I think a financial transaction tax would go a long way because um, most of that is not going into the real economy, and um, and a lot of it is just sort of fueling um, the kind of mindless consumption that is at the heart of the exploding emissions. And then there's military budgets, of course. The US um, military is the single biggest customer for those fossil fuels, um, and often waging wars to get more oil, so burning oil to get more oil. Um, and um, so, there, so there are possibilities, but they are outside the bounds of what is considered acceptable discourse in this country. And, um, and that's why I said at the beginning that a whole lot of things we've been told is, are impossible are going to have to start happening. Um, another pillar of this ideological project of, is privatization, as I mentioned, the idea that, um, that, that, that it's always better to hand over your public in infrastructure to private interests. And of course, in the period that we've been dealing with climate change, since it landed on our laps in the late 19... In the late 1980s, when we lost all plausible deniability, and James Hansen testified on Capitol Hill and said he now had, with he could now say with a high degree of certainty that there was a connection between emissions and warming. Um, since then, our governments have been steadily selling off our electricity grids, um, our transit systems, and the the the, 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 the precisely the infrastructure that we need. To for, to for this transition to happen quickly. So I'm sure that, um, that, that most of you have heard a lot about what's been going on in Germany and their energy transition, which has some good parts of it and some bad parts of it. But one thing that uh, is undeniable that Germany is transitioning very, very quickly towards renewable energy, faster than any country in the world right now. Um, they, ne they now have 25% of their electricity coming from renewable energy, and a lot of it is wind and solar. And a great deal of it is from decentralized, um, community-controlled wind and solar, which is particularly interesting. There are 900 co-ops, energy co-ops, that have emerged, uh, and, um, and a lot of small-scale utilities. What we don't hear in almost any of the stories about Germany's transition is that this very rapid transition is, is only happening because in hundreds of cities and towns, uh, citizens have voted to take back their energy grids from the private companies that privatized them in the 1990s. And they're doing this because the private companies are not willing to be part of the transition, or they're, they're not doing it fast enough because they don't see the profits there. So they want to stay with the old model. And so they have a mechanism in Germany that allows them, when the contracts expire, to vote and, and, and take back their energy. And that's what they've been doing. In Berlin, they had a referendum recently, and 83%, 83 percent of voters voted to take back um, their their energy grid. Hamburg also majority voted to take back the grid. So we're talking about really big cities. This is a big piece of the picture, and it's starting to happen in the U.S. too. Boulder, Colorado, um, same thing. You know, Boulder, crunchy liberal city. Everyone wears fleece and bikes around, but it turns out that all of their power was coming from coal. So they went to their private energy pro provider, a company called Excel, and they said, you know, we want to switch to wind and solar. It's in line with our values, and and the company wasn't interested. They they felt that they that, that the old model was still too profitable, and so there have been a couple of referendums in Boulder where people have voted, despite in the first referendum being. Um, uh, being outspent by a ratio of 10 to 1, um, have voted to, to take their energy back or to explore what's being called remunicipalization. So that's just another example of how doing what we need to do as quickly as we need to do it in the face of this, uh, of this crisis calls into question the pillars of this ideological project that we've all been living under. <clears throat> um, now. Germany's transition, the reason why it's controversial is because 
even though they are switching very um, quickly to renewable energy, their emissions are still going up. So some people say this is because they um, have prioritized nuclear, um, and it shows that you can't do that. But a lot of activists who I know in Germany and pol policy analysts in Germany tell me that it, what the real problem is, is that Merkel is, has, though she has put in place some really great incentives for renewable energy, has been unwilling to say no to coal. She's been unwilling to stand up to a very, very powerful coal lobby in Germany. So uh, even as demand for coal starts to dip in Germany, um, the coal companies are still burning it and then exporting the energy. So it's still counting on, Germany, on Germany's ledger. Um, now, this is obviously very familiar. All of our politicians have trouble saying no to powerful corporations, particularly fossil fuel companies. I mean, look at what a tough time President Obama is having just saying no to the Keystone XL pipeline. It's, we're now well into year three of waffling on this question. Um, but what's, what's um, remarkable, and this is, I spend a lot of time in the, in, in the final section of the book, is that um, all over the world, and particularly in North America, you have communities stepping forward and um, doing what, they're, what our politicians refuse to do, which is say no to this doubling down on fossil fuels. And um, we're seeing it in the huge anti-fracking movement, which I know is very active here. Um, we are seeing it in all of these, uh, all of these movements uh, saying no to tar sands pipelines, whether it's Keystone um, or whether it's there's there are several uh, tar sands pipelines in Canada that also have uh, spawned a very strong resistance movements and built unprecedented coalitions between indigenous people and non-indigenous people, um, and it's actually become a site. These 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 battles have begun sites um, for for anti-colonial struggles of the kind that we've never seen before. Really, what um, non-indigenous Canadians are realizing for the first time is that the fact that um, that First Nations people have protected their land rights over all of these years is the single greatest legal barrier to our government's plans to essentially flay um, northern Alberta and, and detonate what, what James Hansen calls the largest carbon bomb um, on earth. And so there's a huge amount of gratitude and an understanding um, that, that those rights are, are rights that um, are in all of our interests uh, to protect. Now, all of this is, and we're seeing similar resistance up and down um, the West Coast, particularly as it relates to coal export terminals, because as coal um, demand drops in this country, the move, of course, is not to stop mining coal, but to mine it and export it to China. But that can't happen without all kinds of new fossil fuel infrastructure, including new railways um, and big new coal export terminals along, um, you know, all, all, all along the Pacific Northwest. And, you know, the Pacific Northwest is just has an incredible history of environmental activism and is standing up um, to to this push in an incredible way. They've already managed to block half of the proposals for ex for coal export terminals, and the other three are all in trouble. Um, so so this is this is a movement that's having a real impact. And part of the reason it's having an impact is because on the other end, on the export end, where they're taking the coal to, um, where they're taking the tar sands oil to, or they want to um, is China, and China is in the midst of its own uh, fossil fuel resistance because air quality is reaching crisis levels. Um, and so there's a kind of a pincer happening, and it might not even be necessary to kill these projects, it might just be enough to delay them for long enough uh, for China to have its, its own renewable energy revolution, because there's a lot going on with renewable energy in China. And the backlash against, um, against toxic air is so strong um, that it's really like nothing, uh, nothing the Communist Party has seen, well, perhaps since these protests in Hong Kong. Now this is starting to have, there was just some news this week, this is probably the biggest victory in the, in the tar sands fight 
where um, Stat Oil, which is Norway's um, huge state-owned oil company, which is very, very active in the tar sands, announced that it was suspending a multi-billion dollar mine expansion in Alberta, in the tar sands. And, they, and they, one of the reasons they cited was uncertainty about pipeline capacity, <laughs> um, which is basically a way of saying, well, Alberta's landlocked, and we really aren't sure we can get this oil out once we extract it because of all this resistance um, across all of the arteries. So this can't be ad hoc, you know. We need governments that are willing to say no to the fossil fuel industry, to refuse to hand out new permits, refuse to open up new carbon frontiers, and willing to spend the money instead on the green transition. Now, I know many of you are thinking that this will never happen because of money, money in politics, because we don't have democracy, we have Dollarocracy, my, my friend <laughs> Bob McChesney calls it, or oligarchy or oligarchy, whatever your term of choice. Um, and we've all been saying this forever, right? I mean, this is almost how, how almost all progressive conversations end. <laughs> um, indeed, anyone trying to get anything vaguely progressive done in this country, whether they're fighting against private prisons or for good public education or for gun control, knows that the single greatest barrier is the corrupting influence of money in politics. Not just campaign contributions, but lobbying and the revolving door and so-called dark money. It's the same power that has systematically sabotaged every serious attempt at carbon control. So the question I'm left with, and maybe I'm overly optimistic, is could the severity of the climate crisis, the fact that it puts us on such a tight and unforgiving deadline, the fact that it impacts each and every one of us, and no one is exempt, provide the infrastructure for a big tent movement to finally do something serious about it and win? Building a big tent is hard. Progressives have a bad habit of eating their own and turning on one another. But here's the thing, we are already in a big tent. It's called the Earth's atmosphere, that thin membrane of gas responsible for the relatively benign climate to which humans and so many other species have adapted. It's the biggest tent of all. We're in it, and we just need to start acting like it. <laughs> um, now, I'm sure that some of you um, were a little bit excited about the climate march in in New York last week. <laughs> and it was I was I was I was lucky enough to be able to to be a part of it and in fact we raced to get the book out in time for it. Um, if there are any typos, forgive me. Um, and I think we caught them all. Um, but uh, you know, it, 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 was, it, was, it, was, it was perhaps the most remarkable political experience I've ever had. It was an amazing day. <laughs> um, and it was, in fact, it was an amazing week. Uh, you know, everywhere, everywhere we went in New, New York, people were talking about climate change. The subways were filled with ads about how we have to do something about climate change. It was like an alternate universe. Um, you know, there, on any given night in the week leading up to the march, there would be like, for events as big as the one we're having tonight, all about climate change in different venues in the city. Um, I think a, a lot of what we've focused on is that it was the biggest climate march um, that, that, has, that has occurred, and it's true. I mean, it was between 300,000 and 400,000. The biggest one before that was in Copenhagen in 2009, and that was around 100,000. But I don't, what was remarkable about it to me was not the size. Um, it was that, um, it, it looked and felt like this country. <laughs> um, and it was, um, you know, when I, when I was in Copenhagen in 2009, I really wasn't all that inspired by that march of 100,000 people because it was basically a march of NGOs playing beach ball with the earth. Um, not that there's anything particularly wrong with that, but, you know, when you talk to people about um, why it is so hard to get traction on climate change. If you talk to uh, environmentalists, what they'll tell you is that the problem is that even among the people who say that they care, tell pollsters that they don't really care that much. Like, this is not the issue that they um, will that 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 will that they will vote over. Um, it, it is often ranked last on the list of all the other <laughs> issues, um, and it there is this tremendous urgency gap between 
the fossil fuel companies who really, really want to dig up all that carbon and continue to be the richest industry on Earth. That's a very powerful motivating factor. Um, and the way in which we've conceived this movement, um, which has largely been a, a, a movement of of overwhelmingly white professional uh, environmentalists. And, um, and that's a real mismatch. And so what felt really different to me about New York is that all of these pockets of resistance that have emerged, which are the flip side of the fossil fuel frenzy uh, taking place, gathered in one place, as well as people who are on the front lines of uh, already of our toxic economy. So it's the people who are fighting fracking in New York State, who've won a moratorium and are trying to protect that and are worried about their water. This isn't an abstract issue for them. They're passionate about it. You know, people are mortgaging their homes to pay for this movement. It's barely funded by foundations. It is sort of an old-fashioned grassroots movement. and. Um, and then you had, you had the, the, the environmental justice movement that have been fighting toxic industries in their backyard for decades. Um, you know, you, communities, like you had a, a huge contingent from the South Bronx that had made these amazing murals of asthma inhalers. And, um, and, and, and this, there's the stakes for them, the health of their kids and their own health. And also the hope was that these communities could benefit directly from the jobs, from the good unionized jobs that would come from the transition to the next economy. It wasn't abstract, and there was a huge amount of passion. And then you also had the communities that had been hardest hit um, by Superstorm Sandy um, because they were in public housing and they were abandoned um, by the government. Their lights were out for weeks. Um, they're still waiting for reconstruction. And so that urgency gap Start, is starting to close as frontline communities take front and center. And the, the march itself was led um, by indigenous people, um, many of them from Canada who live downstream from the tar sands and are dealing um, with the impacts on their wildlife that I discussed at the beginning, but also cancer clusters in their own communities. Um, that's the kind of movement that we need to build. And I say this with all respect to my friends in the environmental, environmental movement, um, they will not be able to do this on their own. <laughs> this is too big, and nor should they. Um, this is a, a crisis that affects each and every one of us. We can't outsource it uh, to the environmentalists. It's all in. It needs everyone. So serious climate action gives us the infrastructure for a broad-based progressive agenda, and it puts us on that firm science-based deadline. It tells us we can't afford to lose. Instead of trumping or distracting from our most pressing political and economic causes, climate change has the power to supercharge them with existential urgency. It can, and, and you know, my, my, my last book, uh, The Shock Doctrine, was about how crises have been systematically used by our elites over the past 40 years to consolidate wealth. Um, and, and do an end run around democracy. And rather than the ultimate expression of the shock doctrine, a frenzy of new resource grabs and repression, climate change, I believe, can be a people's shock, a blow from below. It can disperse power into the hands of the many rather than consolidating it into the hands of the few and radically expand the commons rather than auctioning off it off in pieces. Because underneath all of this is the real truth that we've been avoiding. Climate change isn't an issue to add to the list of things to worry about next to health care and taxes. It's a civilizational wake-up call, a powerful message spoken in the language of fires, floods, droughts, and extinction, telling us that we need an entirely new economic model and a new way of sharing this planet, telling us that we need to evolve. Thank you. Uh, please uh, fill out the cards if you do have questions and if someone could then bring them up to the stage so I can look through them um, as we're trying to answer as many as possible. So a couple of questions that were given to me at dinner and um, also as I was hearing you talk. Given the need for the people shock, as you call it, 
What have you seen in the research or in the book tour that's the most, is there one thing that stands out as the most encouraging, something we can look at and cheer about, or several things that stand out that can inspire us? I know you mentioned that some events you're having activists come up on the stage with you, so. Yeah. I think the, the thing that, that I'm most excited about right now is, is the p potential of this investment piece of the divestment movement. Because the, 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 the fossil fuel divestment movement is spreading incredibly quickly. Uh, you know, the, it, it, and within six months of the launch of the, the fossil free campaign, um, I should say I'm on the board of 350.org. Um, here I am bashing environmentalists. but. Accept them, um, <laughs> uh, but but 350 was involved in in launching this national um, divestment uh, campaign. There were there were a few campuses that had active divestment um, uh, campaigns focused mostly on coal, um, and uh, and and within just a few months there were chapters on uh, more than 300 campuses. Seattle announced that it was divesting. Now Stanford has announced that it's divesting from coal. So we're starting to get some really big wins. Um, I think the Rockefeller uh, announcement is huge because it's going to make it a lot harder for institutions like the UC system to continue to. Uh, I mean, and UC is already starting to budge a little bit, right? I mean, they, originally it was no, and now it's we're going to take an, another look. And so I think you know when the Rockefellers are divesting, come on. Um, and same with Harvard. I, I think it's only a matter of time. And the students are, are still pushing really, really hard. Um, so the really exciting piece of that to, to me is, is, as I said, not the impact that that w w would have alone on the fossil fuel companies, because of course somebody else is going to buy up those stocks. It's what can be done with those resources, which are significant in terms of investing in the next economy now and, and proving how hopeful this can this can be because we have a lot of really great ideas out there that um, you know that that are languishing for lack of funding or at, or at much too small a scale. And one of the things that I hear most from frontline communities who are saying no to the refinery expansions to the tar sand new tar sands mines is there's only so far we can go just saying no. We have to offer our people something else, um, and that means other kinds of jobs, right? So, for instance, the city of Richmond has waged this heroic. A battle against the Chevron refinery, one of the you know, dirtiest refineries. It's had all kinds of accidents. It's the largest employer in Richmond, so the fate of the community is deeply intertwined with that refinery. But even so, um, activists in, 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 in Rich Richmond with a great deal of support in the community successfully blocked an expansion of that refinery, which would probably have been handling um, bitumen from the tar sands, so would have even increased air pollution significantly and there's already a crisis, crisis levels of asthma. So what they need in Richmond are other kinds of jobs, and they have some great proposals for solar co-ops, and they've gotten one off the ground. But they, you know, th these, are, these are proposals that if they had serious funding, they could be really showing the way. In the book and the film that we're making, we highlight the, um, uh, 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 just the power of this kind of tran transformation um, on the Northern Cheyenne Reservation. Nor the Northern Cheyenne are sitting on one of the largest unmined coal deposits in the country, and there is, they have been under pressure for decades to dig up that coal, and it's a very it's a it's it's a very controversial issue on the reservation. Um, and um, and after resisting for a very long time, uh, they there was a, a, there there was a, a, a band council that was quite pro coal that was elected. And um, when I first went to visit the reservation, I was told by one of the leading anti-coal activists, Philip Whiteman, said, I can't keep asking my people to suffer with me. We have to offer them something else. And one of the, one of the stories that I follow in the book and that particularly we're showing in this documentary film we're making is what happened when um, they, they were able to bring uh, uh, a guy named Henry Red Cloud um, from uh, the Pine Ridge Reservation, who is a solar power entrepreneur, um, and he teaches um, he teaches young uh, Native people to to become solar entrepreneurs on on reservations. He has this vision um, that 
that, as he puts it, Indian country can, be, can get off fossil fuels before the rest of the United States. And what's been amazing to watch is that as, as these jobs, and they're not just jobs, I mean, they're small businesses and, and you know, it's a whole other model. As this comes to the reservation, the fight against coal gets stronger and stronger, and it's just so clear. Um, so that's the piece that I'm most excited about, is how the, 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 the divestment movement could get um, could get resources to frontline communities so that they can both resist and build the alternatives that they need to resist. <clears throat> One question here. I have twin three-year-old boys. This is not me. Um, what can I teach them about their relationship with climate change? Twin three-year-old boys. As, speaking as a new mother, too. <laughs> um, yeah. I mean, I think, I think the the one of the most important things that we can instill in our kids and, and, and in our friends and in one another and in ourselves is just the importance of community. Um, it, because you know, in many ways, having strong community is the most important way that we can prepare for this rocky future. Um, and uh, in terms of teaching, teaching them about the science, I don't know. I'm ambivalent about, about how much you want to tell a really young kid um, and how much you want their experience of nature, their early experiences of nature to be tinged with loss. Um, you know, I've tried to protect my son from that for as long as I can um, so that it's, he just has as pure a love of nature as he can because I think that that's, the, that's what's most important is just developing that connection and that deep love that I think is in all of us and as many experiences as possible. And then we're, we will be, that's what will motivate us to protect. I mean, this is, the, this is what's so striking to me about all of these amazing resistance movements that I've been talking about and, and I've had the privilege of you know, witnessing and documenting is just, they are not driven by hatred of coal or, or tar sands or whatever it is. They, they are movements that are driven by love of place and culture. Um, and, uh, and in many, many cases, it's about really knowing who you are and knowing that your ancestors sacrificed um, for, for a piece of land. And, um, and it, in, in so many cases, like it, it, these movements are leading to this process of people falling in love more deeply with their place in the world. Um, and so, yeah, I think, I think it really is, uh, a, a, like uh, I have a chapter in the book called Love and Water because I, I, I think th that these are the driving forces of these movements is love of place and protection of water, not anti-coal, anti-tar sands, anti-fracking. Anti Before I ask the next question about capitalism, uh, it reminds me that books will be sold afterwards <laughs> <laughs> in the lobby. <laughs> um, Naomi will be signing. Um, and for those of you who don't have the book, I can't encourage you strongly enough to get it and get an opportunity to meet them. Or Naomi. get it from your library. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> or borrow it. Um, so there are several questions here, and I've had one thinking about it since hearing you and reading the book, in terms of capitalism. So I guess two parts to it. How, generally, people don't talk about capitalism. They don't talk about it in the press. They don't talk about it as a system. Kids think capitalism is democracy. So what has the response been to you and the conversation that you're bringing up around capitalism in events like this around the country and also in the press, one part of it, and then the second part of it, you know, we know the line, uh, capitalism will sell you a rope to hang itself if they can make a dollar from it. So how do you see the system working that will force it to adapt, or will it? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, yeah, it's, it's funny, um, the different reactions to, to the word. Um, mostly I just get a kick out of, like, I mean, I've been lucky. I've been doing things like going on morning television and just watching morning television hosts just say the word capitalism makes me smile. It's just worth it just Yay. for that, you know? <laughs> so capitalism, killing the planet, tell us more. Um, and, and, and I've taken a lot of flack for the title, but it's worth it just for that. Um, 
no, I, I think there, there is a lot of sort of liberal fear, and I'm, liberal, I'm using the word sort of centrist liberal or, around like, oh, you don't say that word, but, you know, and, or, or it's, someone said to me the other day, you know, we can't, it's not real capitalism what we have, so, you know, we shouldn't let them have it. So I'm, I'm using capitalism as a substitute for the kind of economy we actually have. So I'm not getting into a semantic discussion, like there was a piece that came out in, in the Harvard Business Review blog a couple days ago, and it was like, well, this isn't real capitalism. It's like, okay, but it's real world capitalism, and real capitalism, as described, doesn't exist anywhere on Earth, okay? So I'm not having an argument with, re with real capitalism. We're having an argument with real world capitalism, AKA the economy, um, and, uh, and, and, and I like talking about capitalism because I actually think for a lot of people, what it evokes really is the greed imperative and the short-term growth imperative. Um, and actually, there is a really vibrant discussion going on in this country about the failures of this economic system. And so, you, you know, like I think because the environmental movement tends to be very centrist, I there is, like I am getting this like, oh geez, you know, um, like it, climate's bad enough, did you have to make it about capitalism too? Um, but the thing that I think they're missing is that people actually are quite unhappy with capitalism right now. And if, if, if we can draw the connections between the logic that's foreclosing on people's homes and the logic that is foreclosing on our collective home, um, then we have something really common to talk about. Um, so I actually think it makes it more populist by, by, by making it about capitalism rather than making it more vanguardist. And I think there tends to be a real you know, underestimation in our intelligentsia about just how pissed off people are um, with 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 what deregulated capitalism has left them with, right? Which is why, you know, something like you know, the, why Occupy resonated, why the Piketty book resonated. I mean, the the, the the inequality stats are staggering. So it's a good time to say, you know, in addition to all of that stuff, um, it, you know, it's also destabilizing, uh, you know, our life support system. So that's extra bad, right? Um, and it, you know, it, it's, it's, and I do think that that is kind of a, a unifying message. The other reason why I think it's important to, to link it to an economic justice agenda, whatever you want to call it, is that that is what's going to bring passion to this movement. You know, there can't, I, last, last night I was speaking in San Francisco, um, in Berkeley, and I, um, the event was sponsored by a wonderful Bay Area uh, climate justice group called Movement Generation. And um, one of the speakers from their group um, said transition is inevitable, justice is not. And that's really important to understand that you know, the, the kind of justice-based responses that would bring jobs to the South Bronx is not inevitable. There can be an unjust response to climate change. We know that. That's what our system will do if left unchecked. And that's, you know, I guess the answer to your question is, you know, well, how will capitalism respond on its own? Well, that's what the shock doctrine was about. I mean, the, the, we know what disaster capitalism looks like. And I think one of, one of the confusing things going on around this discussion is, yes, there is a booming market in green energy. Okay, So we're not saying that you, that you can't find ways to make money um, off of this transition or that you shouldn't. Right? I, I think that, um, that private companies absolutely have a, a big role to play in this transition. But, but, but they will not get us off fossil fuels. I mean, leaving it to the market, just putting in a sort of gentle market mechanisms, or sometimes people talk about tax and relax, like we just need to put a price on carbon, then we don't need to do anything else. That will not bring our emissions down to zero by mid-century, which is what scientists are telling us we need to do. Um, it will help, uh, but it will not do it fast enough. Because what our system is doing is, yes, it's, we, have, uh, we have a boom in green energy, Yes, we have a massive boom in fossil fuels, extra dirty ones. And yes, we will also find a way to profit from the wreckage. All of the above, right? And it's as bad a policy as all of the above energy policy, right? It, it's, it's um, you know, if we believe this is, as John Kerry says, you know, this is akin to weapons of mass destruction. If this is, as Ban Ki-moon says, the greatest crisis facing the human family, you, why would you respond by creating a market in pollution? You would respond forcefully. You would, you, you would have wartime levels of response. And speaking of war, um, 
you talk somewhat about a couple of related parts, the relationship of the anti-war movement to the environmental movement, and also the role of the military in terms of pollution and in terms of the environment and how we make those connections. Do we make those connections? How does the big tent become bigger and include the anti-war movement? I think it's a it's a really it's a, it's a really crucial piece, and I probably should have spent more time on it in the book. And I was actually just talking to Earl Katz, the documentary filmmaker producer, earlier about how there is this way in which, if we treat these issues as separate, they will draw energy away from each other. So there's it's not just that they're related. That yeah, we burn fossil fuels to get fossil fuels, <laughs> you know, in the in in and and kill people. Um, to do so, um, it's it's also that one of the one of the ways in which we fail to deal with climate is that you know when there is a more pressing emergency, it will always fall even lower down that list of that urgency. So you know it will always be trumped by the need to stop an immediate war, um, and it will always be trop trumped by an economic crisis. Right? I mean, this is what's happened in Europe in the midst of the in the midst of of, of the the post 2008 economic crisis all of these great green energy programs across Europe with the exception of Germany you know in Greece in Spain in Portugal they've rolled back really good renewable energy programs in the name of getting out of debt in the name of you know fighting you know yeah, paying back creditors. Greece is being told that they need to drill for oil in the Ionian and Aegean seas, which is completely insane when their two major industries are tourism and fishing. Um, so, but this is what happens. If you've got a severe economic crisis, the planet gets thrown under the bus. So this is why, just very practically, we need a holistic vision um, that connects war and economic crisis and the environment. It is, it is a single system, <laughs> um, and we have to start acting like it, um, or, 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 the, or we'll lose all of it. <laughs> <laughs> is it true there's going to be a movie? That trailer that you saw, um, I mean, the reason we were able to have such you know, rich visuals for a book trailer is because there's actually a documentary film. Um, and, uh, and yeah, my, my um, husband, Avi Lewis, we made a film together in 2004 called The Take. Um, Wonderful about, film, by the way. And, um, and we haven't made a film together since. Um, but th and this isn't really. Um, I mean, we've learned from past experiences that this we, we, that we the book was my project and the film is his project. This is how we managed to not kill each other, and um, and 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 so we, we were able to travel together and go to different you know have this parallel research process. And the the film is really exciting to me because. The, it's really a symphony of voices, and you it, it it's it it shows. Um, what an incredibly diverse movement th this is, and 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 so many of the frontline voices that you know I'm talking about in their absence get to speak for themselves, which is what's so great about film. So I feel like the the two pieces work really really well together. And they, and Avi actually just finished his, the fine cut yesterday, so it's coming, great. and we're hoping it'll come out um, in festivals um, maybe in January. We're lucky. Good. Um, do you talk about India and China? The other big polluters, what's our role? Do we have impact? What can we do, if anything? Or how will that evolve? Yeah, I mean, I think, I think the, the, the first piece to, to understand is, is, you know, we have to stop using um, China, you know, a, a, as an excuse. I think this is a, a big way in which we sort of tell ourselves we don't have to do anything, because what does it matter? China's just going to open a coal plant a week anyway. We need to look at what's happening in China, which is this very, there is this much more vibrant debate about the real cost of economic growth because it's just so breakneck. And they're literally choking on it. And you know, kids are going to school you know, in pollution masks um, with cute cartoon characters on them. It's completely surreal. And, um, and it, it is creating, as I said, a, a, a real political crisis in that country. And there are huge renewable energy programs rolling out. The problem with China is just everything is huge. So it's both, right? Um, and, and this is why I think it is so important for countries that had a 200-year head start on emissions to lead. Um, because if we don't, then we strengthen the hand of the forces within China and India that say, we have the right to pollute. It's our turn, which we just heard um, uh, um, from Modi, uh, I think just yesterday. 
um, but you know, we, ha we have to understand, you know, he doesn't speak for all of India. There are massive anti-coal movements, and this is one of the things that Avi documents in the film, is just you know, the huge anti-coal resistance movements in India, um, because, they're, they're, because, because of the, 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 the land impacts, I mean, because of those direct, uh, direct impacts on fishing, and I mean, these are toxic industries. So it isn't just the air pollution. And, and um, so we need to be supporting those forces in India and China and other countries. And the best way we can support them is by not giving their governments the best argument, to, um, which is just like, well, why should we, you know, wh why should we do this when it's our turn and they've been doing it and they're still not cutting their emissions, which is what we're doing now. We're giving that argument to their leaders. Um, I actually, you know, I start the book uh, talking about how what what, ult what ultimately got me to stop averting my eyes from climate change because I, I think you know we're all in our own versions of climate change denial. Even if it's fun to laugh at the Heartland Institute, you know we all deny climate change in our own way just to get through the day. And and for me, what what finally allowed me to 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 focus on this was a conversation I had with. Um, with uh, a woman named Angelica Navarro, who is, um, at the time, she was Bolivia's trade ambassador to the WTO. I met her in Geneva. I was working on a story for Harper's Magazine. Um, interestingly, that story was about reparations for slavery and colonialism. It was about what happened to the reparations debate. <laughs> um, and I know some people in this room were very involved in that debate. And the argument that she, um, she made to me is that climate change is the best argument that the Global South has ever had for the justice that is owed to them by the unjust colonial plunder. This is Bolivia, right? This is a country who had its gold and silver plundered. As Galliano said, you could build a bridge to Europe um, um, on, that, on that silver. And, um, and and the, the, the reason for that is that carbon leaves such a distinctive record. We know who emitted what when, um, and we know who is feeling the impacts first. I mean, Bolivia is so vulnerable to climate change. Its, it's major cities are fed by glaciers, and those glaciers are melting. Um, and they've done almost noth nothing to contribute to this crisis, so the injustice of it is so severe. Our governments, in theory, have agreed to the principle that there should be an equi equitable equity-based response that's enshrined in the UN Climate Convention. It's called Common but Differentiated Responsibility. That means we all have responsibility, but not the same kind. <laughs> um, so what, what Angelica said to me is, is climate change can be the catalyst for a Marshall Plan for planet Earth. Um, and it was the first time I had heard an inspiring vision um, for how we can respond to this crisis and how it could be uh, a tool for justice denied. Um, and the, 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 the scars that cleave our world between our countries and within them are intimately tied to the history of fossil fuels because it was the steam engine that supercharged the colonial project. And we are dealing with the after effects of that um, in the form of climate change. But this is really all the same story. It's, they're not different stories. They're just different, different chapters of the same story. <laughs> See how we're doing on time. You okay for... Ooh, it's almost done. Two more questions? Okay. Um, what would you say to a geologist being recruited to work at BP? <laughs> Don't. <laughs> um, I mean, if, you know, I don't know, I don't know, you know, your life circumstance, it's easier said than done. Um, I mean, I don't know how bad you need the job. I don't know what your other options are. Um, but if you have other options, I think you'll feel better about using your vast talents <laughs> on something other than helping BP to dig ever deeper under our oceans. <laughs> Um, and you know, one of the really exciting parts of this movement has been the way climate scientists have stepped out of their own comfort zone and um, and 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 used their incredible brains <laughs> to try to warn us and to increasingly convey a sense of real urgency with their actions. Um, you know, I was arrested at the 
protests against the Keystone XL pipeline next to Jason Box, who's a fantastic um, specialist in, in, in Antarctic glaciers and James Hansen was arrested and there was a scientist block at the climate march um, which was really amazing um, and uh, yeah join them if you can I, I don't know I mean I'm not saying it's you you're asking for a friend right um, do you agree or disagree with James Hansen's advice about nuclear power being an essential component to averting climate catastrophe um, now, I love James Hansen, um, and I hate to disagree with James Hansen. Um, we all owe him such a tremendous debt of gratitude. He is the real, you know, the godfather of this movement in so many ways. Um, but yeah, I disagree with him on nuclear. Um, and, you know, I understand why um, people looking at the current power configurations as they are believe that we need these centralized solutions um, these, the, uh, that are less threatening to our elites. I mean, I think the reason why nuclear is, 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 is seen as a more practical option is not because we can't get to 100% renewable energy. We can. I mean, there's amazing research out of Stanford by Mark Jacobson that says we can get to 100% renewable energy with the existing technologies by 2030, okay? The problem is, that um, the, the problem is that renewable energy is, is, is quite challenging to existing power structures because it's inherently decentralized. The thing about um, both fossil fuels and nuclear, any extractive industry, is that um, it, is, it, 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 it is intimately tied to our unequal economic system because you have resources that are buried beneath the earth that take a lot of money to get out, a lot of money to refine, a lot of money to transport, and then in the case of nuclear, a lot of money to deal with the waste. Okay, So that is a system that's going to lend itself to monopoly power, to a few small players, to a corporatist structure between corporations and government. So for people who are defending that, very profitable status quo, it's a lot easier to switch from fossil fuels to nuclear than it is to switch to renewable energy, which is a system that is that is trading in free stuff, free wind, free sun, free waves. That's everywhere. Um, so you know, it's not that money can't be made, but you're not going to make the kind of stupid money that you make from fossil fuels off renewable energy, and that's why. It's so threatening, um, and you know if you have a feed-in tariff and people are able to put solar panels on their roofs and feed into the grid, those people are energy producers. They're not just energy consumers. Each and every one of them is a competitor for a traditional utility. So obviously they're going to fight that model. Now I understand why somebody who is you know a NASA, spent their life working for NASA as opposed to me who spent my life working in social movements believes that we're screwed enough that we have to go for these centralized solutions that are less threatening to the status quo. I'm throwing my lot in with social movements. Um, and I understand why, I even understand why a lot of scientists believe that geoengineering is the only way. If, if we look at where we're at right now, um, and we believe we can't change the political configurations, then it makes sense why you would be looking at nuclear and, and, and geoengineering. But precisely because these are so high risk, um, that's all the more reason why it's up to the rest of us to build the kind of broad-based social movements that can change those structures of power. So I guess what I'm saying is I, I, un I understand, but from my perspective, the problem is not just fossil fuels. The problem is an extractive mindset um, that creates sacrifice zones. I think that at the heart of this, this is not just about fossil fuels. This is about the logic that made us believe we could build our economies on a toxic system that has always been based on sacrificial places and sacrificial people. Coal was never clean. Um, and nuclear demands the same of us. Once again, I am not talking about um, next generation nuclear in the same way that I'm not talking about you know, real capitalism. You know, I know that there are people who are saying that next generation nuclear will just run off waste and will have no risk. I don't know about that kind of nuclear. I know about the nuclear that we have. Um, and and I, know, I know quite a bit about the risks associated with it. And 
we have to get away from energy models that ask other people to eat the risk. Um, and, and it is possible to power our lives without sacrifice zones, um, whether that's dealing with the waste, dealing with the extraction or the combustion. Um, and I don't think we switch from one high-risk model to another. So. <laughs> So the last question before Naomi will be in the lobby signing books. Um, you talked about it at the end here, and it's something we talk about a lot at uh, Brave New Films. So social movement versus elite strategy, social movement versus electoral politics. We're at a moment now where everyone's email is filled with the world will come to an end if the Democrats lose the Senate. Um, and so explain to us, clearly you're uh, advocating for social movement, explain how that works, why it can have impact, what we can do. Yeah, I mean, I, I, think, I think we, in, in, this is one area where we do need all of the above. <laughs> um, I think we need all these strategies simultaneously. Um, it's not just going to be social movements. It's going to be social movements working with really smart technocrats on great policy and and reclaiming and reimagining what we can ask of our political system. Um, we certainly can't opt out of that. Uh, we need to fix it. Is what we need to do. We can't. We, you know, we need to engage with it. And uh, you know, I talked a little bit about money and politics. Um, you know, I I do think that that issue is. Um, you know, it's a good place to start building these types of coalitions that get us all in the same room together. Um, and there's already a huge amount of work being done in that area. Um, but I think the point is, is that the social movements create that pressure uh, f to win the really good strategies, you know? I mean, right now people are talking about, uh, you know, we, <laughs> like, we build, we, we, we've been trying to build coalitions around climate change, but they've been elite coalitions, right? Where it's like, we need to get the military on board, we need to get the polluters on board, and, um, and, and that's actually, that's how, the environmental movement tried to get cap and trade passed, was getting the polluters in the same room to write the law, literally, right? And then at the last minute, they decided, actually, we don't want a law at all, and they pulled out <laughs> and spent all of their lobbying money fighting against the law. Um, but uh, it, I think what's important about an inside-outside strategy, which I really believe in, we can't just have an outside strategy, is that there need to be systems of accountability between the outside and the inside. Um, and you know that that's what works about the labor movement is that actually there are systems of democracy and accountability between at least in theory um, labor leadership and la labor membership. What I don't, what I worry about is sort of. Um, a kind of a bait and switch where you have this amazing climate justice movement that is being led by frontline communities, many of them communities of color that need resources in their communities, that need good jobs in their communities. And we we ha still have like very some elite environmental groups that just want to sort of use that energy and say, okay, well, we're gonna do this and we're just gonna ask for a small carbon tax and that's it. Um, and we're also gonna give all the money back for that carbon tax so we don't have any of the money to spend in communities communities on the infrastructure that they need that are going to deliver the justice-based responses that are the reason people are marching in the streets. So this is a part of a much bigger discussion about whether there really is a left, whether there, you know, whether we still remember how to build social movements, right? Because we know we've so atomized and you know we have professional NGOs instead of those social movements, those structures. I mean, this I think is something that we really have to remember and I know that it's, it can sound a little hopeless and maybe this is a question we should have started with and not ended with, but you know, that ideological project that I was talking about, that war on the public sphere has been enormously successful. So we are rebuilding in the rubble of the the, of neoliberalism, of the attacks on not just the public sphere, but on the very idea of the public, on the very idea of collective action. And we're facing the ultimate collective crisis. So in so many ways, what we need to do is rebuild the very idea of collective action. And um, you know, and that's why you know, it's nice that nobody asks the question of like, okay, so what's the one thing I can do or what's the one thing I can buy? But Because so often we're so trained to think only as consumers um, and we forget that we can act collectively in movements. So 
this, you know, this is a reconstruction project. We have to <laughs> think of this moment as, as a, reconstructive, a reconstruction project. I think the good news and the, the, the part that we, need, that, that we have to remember is that this is what social movements do. They change the culture. They don't just reflect the culture back and say, this is all we can be. They dream in public and say, we can be more and we can change. We're complex, yes, we're greedy, we're selfish, but we're also compassionate and, um, and generous and, 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 and we have different parts of ourselves that can be lit up in different moments. And it's the role of social movements and collective action to light up those different parts of ourselves that have been lit up in different stages in history. You know, the, the pendulum swung really far in one direction, and it was part of a really deliberate process. Margaret Thatcher said, the tool is economics, but the goal is to change hearts and minds. Um, and we need to change it back. <laughs> um, and that's why, you know, the fossil fuel companies are digging deep, and we really need to dig deep, too. This, we need to understand that this is a battle, ultimately, not about policies, but about values, um, and what values we want to, to govern our societies. And, um, you know, look, it's big. <laughs> Thanks, everybody. Thank you.